Welcome everybody to today's lightning lecture on operational technology cybersecurity. Um, we'll be delving into the complexities of securing critical infrastructure in the digital age. We'll explore the nuances between OT and IT security and offer insights into enhancing cybersecurity posture for organizations operating in various sectors. Our esteemed lecturer, James, brings a wealth of expertise to the table, hailing from Houston, Texas. James is a graduate of Texas A&M with a degree in mechanical engineering and industrial distribution. James has a deep understanding of the intersection between technology and the industry. Without further ado, let's turn the floor over to James to kick off our exploration into OT cybersecurity. Welcome, James. Hello, everyone. Let me see if I can make this adjustment here. Get a nice ergonomic position for our notes. But before I begin, we are here to talk about operational technology and cybersecurity. How many people have actually even heard the term operational technology? Have we heard this term before? You have. <laughs> have you heard of information technology? <laughs> IT, operation technology is OT. There is an inherent difference. There is a difference, and we'll get to those differences here in a minute. But that is what we're here to discuss, <laughs> operational technology and its nexus point with information technology and as Honeywell pertains to these things in the industry. Before we begin, we'll talk about cybersecurity as it pertains to the news. Uh, one of the things that we start to notice is that, that as time goes on, cybersecurity isn't just hacking in and stealing information, people's passwords or credit card numbers anymore. People are actually trying to destroy things, as unfortunate that is, as that is. These things are becoming physical. One of the things that we can discuss in the news that we've had happen is, for example, the oil pipeline. Some people have gone through, I can't remember the cyber agency or the entity that takes care of these things, or does these things, right? But they want to shut down an oil pipeline. What happens when you shut down oil? People don't have a oil supplies, so you have shortages. And you also have a surge in pricing. I certainly don't want to go and have to pay the extra prices to put gasoline in my car. I don't want to have to be relegated to stay in my home because I don't have gasoline to put in my car. But these are things that are being done by cyber entities to cause havoc, to create damage, or to even create distractions. One of the other things that we have happened is the MGM Grand. Is anyone familiar with what happened at the MGM Grand? Did anybody hear about what happened at the MGM Grand? I'll take that as some of us have. <laughs> All so, the gamblers. They got the gambler list. Exactly, right? So basically what happened here is in a matter of 10 minutes, an entity was able to shut down the MGM grant for an entire day of the operations. They shut down slot machines, they shut down card access, they shut down fire alarm, lighting, door access, everything. And it shut this place down. People could not get in, people could not get out, people could not move. But what this causes is damage to money. It causes damage to reputation. And it can cause damage in ways that sometimes aren't always even directly understood. Because some things can happen on the front or on the surface the other damage that happens on the inside, perhaps physical to the building, also causes extraordinarily high financial issues. Next we can move into cyber and movies. Movies, in reality, aren't always the same thing, right? We can all, we have the, the old argument, does art mimic life? Or does life mimic art, right? It's kind of hard to define. You don't really know which way it is going to go, but in many cases, they're not so, so far off, they're not so different. One of the first examples I'll give is actually something called White House and Hound with, with Channing Tatum. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was kind of a fun little movie to watch. It was a little bit uh, bombastic in some cases, but there is something that happened in here. For people who work in the HVAC industry, it's interesting to see HVAC get into the, into the movies. You don't see that every day. Right? So basically, the, the synopsis of what's happening here is they're trying to kill the President of the United States. And the President is in a hospital at some point, but somebody was able to hack the operational technology system of the hospital. And in so doing, was able to control where people were moving in the building as they were trying to extract the President. Which means if you have a sniper in position someplace else, you can control where someone's going to end up to reveal his position so that you can take him down. That would be very bad by locking doors and controlling the path outside of the building. Operational technology is not an information technology, and this is why these differences are, are, are very, very real. 
They aren't real just in the sense that this happens in reality. They're real in the sense that these things are physical. They physically happen. Because operational technology isn't something that exists with ones and zeros. While it may be controlled by ones and zeros, these things are physical, articulating, moving pieces of equipment and hardware. That brings us to our mega trends in cybersecurity. So some of the things that you might find interesting is that these threats are increasing at a very rapid rate. And what are, what are some of the reasons? Does anybody have any ideas of what some of these reasons might be why they're increasing at a rapid rate? I'll take that as, James, I want you to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe because it's more fun. Maybe because it's more destructive. Or maybe it's just easier to do. Well, the reality is, is that maybe it's all three. But the thing that is the most appealing, the thing that's the most alluring, or almost irresistible to a cyber hacker, is that it's just easy to do. Now, why might it be easy to hack into an operational technology system as opposed to an information technology system? Again, I'll ask, does anybody have any ideas? Let's go, Rio. We've spent maybe two decades now building up our IT defenses, and we might not have thought about OT defenses. That is a 100% correct answer. <laughs> I'm sure it's because you're a very intelligent and well-versed man, <laughs> and you're also probably sitting next to someone who might have some insight. I don't know. <laughs> I get the sense that the, the vigor with which you said that is that it came from something you fundamentally understood. But it is. It's because these things have been left unattended to. Operational technology systems can be old and aging, they're antiquated, and when these things were installed, they had different reasons for installation. They weren't thinking about, let me secure it. They weren't thinking about, how can I secure this? They're antiquated systems with antiquated methodologies. For example, daisy chain. Has anybody heard of daisy chain? Has anybody heard of a series connection for electrical circuits? Okay. So basically, instead of having a bunch of things operating somewhat independently of each other. They're operating in one long string, one long tunnel. You get into one end of the tunnel, you can get all the way to the end of the tunnel and hit every little thing along the way in that tunnel. Daisy chaining is an old way of wiring or configuring physical assets or physical controllable electronic assets in a system. But when you're looking at things to find, when you're looking for things to do, a hacker might be able to notice, hmm, this system has daisy chain assets. That probably means they didn't think very hard about their security. That probably means they haven't updated anything. That looks like an easy target for me. And that can lead someone to want to penetrate a system. Based on our internal data, as you can see up here on the screen, 81% of intrusions based on the people that we polled were impacted on the OT systems. And furthermore, 32% 30, of those intrusions were specifically designed for industrial environments. This is the part that I find interesting, is that only 15% of those companies that we surveyed monitored 80% or more of their assets. And no, I cannot tell you who we surveyed. <laughs> I don't want anyone going in there and trying to figure out which companies they might have a really good chance of breaking into. And one of the other metrics that we don't have on the screen is that 90% of organizations that we polled had at least one intrusion in the past year. And still, 78% had three. Just a quick question. Sure. This is the things that we hear about when we see a new story saying, oh, the water utility in this little town got hacked. Yes. Uh, you know, the municipality cannot charge anything. They are out of control of their, I don't know, billing systems for tax. These are things that we're finding, like this oh, sort of loss. 100%. I'll tell you why. So what I didn't do yet was define exactly what operational technology is. And what operational technology is, and like I said earlier, is something that physically moves, it articulates. But think things like actuators. An actuator is like a lever that opens something. Think a control valve, something that opens a gate for water flow or for oil flow. Think pressure sensors. Think thermostats. Think temperature sensors, right? And why might all of those things be important? I want you to think about that while I discuss and move on to the next slide here momentarily. Not surprisingly, 
because of this rapid increase. We have had a rise in government regulations for wanting to create a drive for security for not just information technology, but for operational technology. So just as Rio said, information technology has a much more mature cybersecurity posture. Operational technology does not, but we are running into issues where when cybersecurity is viewed by people from higher up in companies, they view it as operational technology, information technology, they're the same. We can run them all together, but that's not necessarily the case. With these cyber threats and OT threats, they need to be handled differently. We need to be handled seriously with a severe dedication to actually contributing to an OT cybersecurity posture, not just an IT one, or not just a hand-me-down IT version on your OT version. So now we'll discuss some of the stark differences between IT and OT. But one of the things that I would like to posture, go back real quick. I have another thing I'd like to share. You guys ever heard of a show called Mr. Robot? Mr. Robot also has something in it that has to do with HVAC or information technology. Now we've already we defined that these things are physical. We define that it control the physical environment find that it can destroy things. So if you want to destroy information, how might you do that? Well, I could walk into a data center with an ax, and I could start hacking away and destroying these pieces of equipment. I could walk in with a flamethrower or launch a chemical attack, or I could just cook it. The reason you can just cook it is because in a data center, a computer, in a computer environment, they're temperature controlled. They're, you could go as far as to say that they are refrigerated. And if it gets too hot, that information cooks and dies. We don't want that to happen. And that's a very real reality that we face with protecting information data centers, secure facilities, and so forth, mission critical facilities. And in Mr. Robot, they show just that. He hacks into an HVAC system in a data center to disable the temperature control and cook data and destroy data. It's an extremely pivotal moment in that show, and it leads to the rest of the show based on the reparations of what had happened there. So now we can talk about the differences between IT and OT. And remember what OT is. <clears throat> we hear a lot about IT with stolen information, stolen data. But it's more, these stolen pieces of information are more benign when compared to the physical and real threat that we face with OT. And this is not just because these communities <coughs> So this goes back to the differences between IT and OT. With IT, these things are being stolen. You have information. OT, you have physical threats, very real physical threats. But because this threat is very real, well, they need to work very differently with a different IT strategy. As I mentioned earlier, what Rio brought up is the mature state of IT. A lot of companies are moving to cover the operational technology with information technology, but it's not the same because information technology has an interoperability that operational technology does not. Information technology is based on a mature set of standards that allow these things to work together. They allow different IT networks and infrastructures to kind of follow the same standards. But operational technologies are made by different manufacturers, different pieces of equipment. Imagine trying to govern a pressure sensor with the same sort of standards that you would have for a control valve. They don't really work the same. They don't work the same at all. And that's why it's very important to understand the differences between IC and OT, and that they can't just be handed down or con 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 controlled together through the same methodology as you would IT. So at Honeywell, we like to take something called a holistic approach to covering our OT environment. And what we mean by that is not just covering one thing. What we mean by that is not just providing cyber hardening for a piece of equipment and leaving it alone. What that means is protecting not just the equipment, but the entire environment itself. You have an environment in which operational technology exists. Let's say, for, for instance, a data center or a power plant. While a piece of equipment might be hard under cybersecurity, difficult for somebody to get into, that doesn't mean they can't get into the environment itself. Not all threats are coming from some guy in his basement 
on its computer trying to get into your system. Sometimes your threat can come from within. They call it the insider threat. And sometimes an insider threat can do it from home because they have credential access. Or sometimes an insider threat is somebody who is physically on site plugging into a piece of equipment that he has credentials to access and has the ability to destroy. We call it it's the coverage from the ground floor, the shop floor to the top floor. So think of something called social engineering. I mentioned to you the insider threat, right? But in my laptop right now, I have two things plugged into it. I have a USB, and I have an HDMI cable. In many senses, people can say that is a no-no. You don't do that. And the reason why I state that is social engineering. Let's say somebody knew or thought that I had access to sensitive information, that I contained that on my computer, and they knew I was coming here. How hard would it be for them to have simply just swapped that USB drive and sit on this, this tabletop right here? And I plug that USB drive into my computer, and now I have malware on my computer. Or now somebody else has my credentials, or somebody else has access to something that they should not. That is a very serious and real problem. These things happen more often than I'd like them to. So now we have a consideration for cyber strategies. This is uh, in the interest of time. It's a very long slide, but the bottom line of this is to think about securing your environment and minimizing the business disruption. When things shut down, that's when you can become exposed. You don't want to have to systematically and routinely shut down your system to provide security or operations, and they should run all at once at all times and being self-sufficient. And if you don't, if you don't, or if you fail to protect information or someone else's intellectual property, think about all the fees or the monetary costs or the lawsuits that it can cause your company. There isn't just the damage to your reputation. There isn't just the damage to your physical structures or to lives. But then there are also monetary aspects to that as too. Lawsuits, fines, legal action, litigation. So now we can move on to, are you putting your site safety at risk? Do you know what all assets are connected to your operational technology system? Probably not. A significant portion of the people that we work with have no idea what's plugged into their system. If they don't know, then how do they know if something malicious has been plugged into their system? And the thing is, is they wouldn't. The solution truly is to have ongoing, constant monitoring. We'll talk about each one of these points in the next slide as we proceed. So do you know all your assets? And again, probably not. 90%, 96% of the customers that we interview have no idea. Or they know very little. And think about how terrifying that might be. Back to the daisy chaining example. Old ways, equal and easy target. And if you aren't familiar with what's necessary to keep your system protected, you might not even realize how much of an easy target you are. Or you might not realize that you have this giant blinking arrow that says, please attack me. I am super easy to penetrate. So now how do you know if malware is on your system? You might not. There is actually a metric that states that it takes about 270 days, a 270 day gestation period for the, from the moment of infection to the moment of attack. You might have malware literally sitting on your computer learning about you, learning about your organization, and learning on how to destroy you for 270 days before even realizing that it's there. And you can't know unless you're constantly monitoring, or you have an extraordinary lack for consistently, uh, not lack, knack, for consistently perfect timing. <clears throat> I don't think any of us really have that. So now what if your critical systems are not cybersecurity compliant? Well, the bottom line here, you know, to put plain and simple, is that you need to make an effort to ensure that operational technology is something that is actually devoted to a solution, has, has a devoted solution to it. So can you show is your CISO the strength of your cybersecurity posture? I'm assuming that probably nobody knows what a CISO is, but what a CISO is is actually a, sweet, a C sweet uh, role, which stands for Chief Information Security Officer. We have all kinds of different systems that run on our legacy, legacy networks. 
some called BACnet, some called LAN, some called um, Modbus, right? These are all different protocols. You got token protocols, you have IP based protocols, things that are all different. And the older they are, the more antiquated they are. Do you really want to confront your CISO with the fact that, hey, uh, I've been really, uh, been really sitting down on the job here and we haven't had a secure system for the last 20 years? And there's also the uh, adage, well, if it's always been okay, then it should be okay now. But as a significant logical fallacy, just because it always worked, doesn't mean it will continue to work because we're in an ever-evolving and changing environment where people are getting smarter and resources are becoming more available to more threats everywhere in the world. And do you have the skilled personnel to look after your OT systems? We at Honeywell recognize that it is very difficult to find cybersecurity individuals who are qualified to do this job specifically in operational technology because operational technology isn't as well known as information technology. People, they go to college, they want to learn about IT, but they don't really think about OT. And so when you graduate with an IT, uh, IT style degree, OT might be left off. And again, we understand that the level of expertise is not the same. And there might be some on the job training or experience that's required to create a secure and mature posture. This is a pivotal moment for cybersecurity because the nexus point of IT and OT in the ever evolving market that we have today and for switches, flippers, uh, malicious things that you can buy on the dark web that help you just find information from someone's credit card in the pocket as you walk by, or something that allows me to figure out how to get into someone's car because I have an antenna that we can uh, copy and then relay the signal from someone's key in their house. You can go buy this, sometimes on eBay. That's kind of terrifying. There needs to be a very serious approach to cybersecurity. There needs to be a very serious approach to operational technology. And with that, I have completed this presentation <laughs> with about one minute. Over to it. Thank you guys very much. training for people how to identify what phishing is and how to identify phishing emails is very important. Obviously, sometimes the examples that you get in your training programs are very hand-fisted, right? It's, like, oh, it's such an obvious, like, yeah, you know, steal my info at email.com, right? It's like, okay, I get that. It's not very innocuous, right? But uh, we have also ones that are very sophisticated. For example, I actually was uh, tricked by one about two weeks ago. And I'll tell you just how sophisticated these things are getting. And I have had this drill into my head to not open links, to not fall prey to phishing emails. And I have many reps, and even I was uh, misled. I was caught with the lure, right? But I'll tell you what happened. I was having a conversation with a customer about a contract and an award, right? And in the middle of my email thread about this, this contract bid, which was complicated, right? I received a response from the original sender, telling me that the contract was ready and to please access the contract from their uh, external Dropbox, which is how we do a lot of things. <laughs> I thought it was him in the middle of my email. So I clicked it, and Honeywell actually discovered it and blocked it. Honeywell figured out that it was malicious, responded that fast, and just uh, prevented it from being able to steal my credentials. But after I was compromised. There was a measure to change my credentials to make sure that any credentials that may have been uh, procured have been changed and are now uh, rendered useless to whoever may have gotten them. I don't know if that entirely answers your question, but it might give you some perspective. 
often do these threats happen or attacks happen to people at home, right? Like you're talking about the car or I, mean, I, I don't even know what other ways people could attack me and my operations. They happen a lot. I don't know exactly how often they happen. I'm not an expert in that area. But also depends on the company you keep, the circles you're in, where you supply your email, right? What type of vendors you're giving your email to. If you don't, be wary of who you're providing it to. Sometimes you may or may not be aware certain vendors are actually compensated to sell your information. So you have to be wary about the ones that you provide your information to because you can sell it to the wrong buyer. That wrong buyer might put it in the realm of reach for somebody who might have less than savory intentions. Uh, with the car, I've seen a couple of videos of that, but I haven't seen it in person. I did see someone trying to break into a car with a sling in last week. <laughs> That's not really as technologically advanced. <laughs> it still works. Yeah. We, uh, I imagine Honeywell has a lot of clients who are very large industrials or utility companies, things of that nature. Um, do you find that typically solutions are often tailor made, or do you have kind of a pack of like, this is what we come in and install? Is it just wondering where the spectrum is? It's a bit of both. So it's kind of like you buy a suit off the rack and you take it to a tailor. So there's an out of the box solution that has to be tailored to a customer and the customer's specific needs. It doesn't just work super easy here, plug this in, fire, and forget. There is that basic framework that needs to be adjusted and adapted and tailored to the specific needs of a specific customer. Now that uh, percentage of change is variable, giving anywhere from 40 to you know five percent change, just based on what they what they perceive as their needs. And these things can be ongoing as well. You're welcome. I was actually employing one last week. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the situation of utilities, particularly water utilities in towns, which tend to be... Um, huge target? Eh? A huge target? <laughs> no, I'm, like, uh, I'm researching some of that, so okay. I, I've been looking at it, and I, my understanding is that it's a huge problem area because they're usually concerned about pipes first, not really about their cyber security and then they are hostage. So I was wondering if uh, you could provide further information like what are um, sort of possible solutions or strategies for utilities might not be that big, but they might not have, you know, a dedicated team. Sure. Product. There are products that, that exist that allow for continuous monitoring. Obviously, you want to have a firewall. Mm -hmm. You want to have continuous monitoring. You want to have contingency plans for when someone trips your monitor. Early warning detection systems, deception systems. The key to preventing these things from happening, the key to prove to, to nullifying, not nullifying, reducing damage is acting quickly. You cannot act quickly unless you have continuous monitoring. So one of the things that we actually kind of implement is what we call the Honeywell Threat Defense Platform. It's pretty cool. Uh, basically what it is, and I'm not trying to sell you this, but basically what it is, I think it's cool, right? You ever heard of something called Honeypot? Anybody heard of the Honeypot, right? I think it's funny that we don't call them Honeywells because we are Honeywell, right? But what they are is it's a little deception platform. You have these very real assets that exist on a network that a uh, a hacker might be able to see when they pull the information from the network, but what this system does is it also creates diversions, fake ones, right? And the plan is to, when it senses that someone is attempting to penetrate the system, learn that person's interests, learn that person's patterns, and then create a breadcrumb trail that lures them away from the real assets and into a fake one. And when they land on a fake one, and during this whole time, it's pulling information from this hacker telling you where he is, what IP address he has, what his house might be, what device he's using, how far away he is. And during this time, it's creating this forensic report that you can use to help go and prevent this from ever happening again, but at the same time also buying you time because this person is being lured away from the real assets, but it's notifying you that someone is attempting to penetrate the system. It buys you time to deploy your countermeasures or to lock down your system. It's not entirely unlike what you see in the movie where someone gets a phone call from someone he's trying to avoid and he's on the call for so long and you're like, oh my God, I've been on the call for 45 seconds to try to emulate my position, right? But what it's doing is just giving you the runaround, holding them off to buy you time to figure out where they are so that you can prevent it from happening for them. I don't know if that's gonna also fully answer your question, but the reality is that continuous monitoring, early detection is the true solution for for preventing cyber attacks. So, um, I was 
You said? Yeah. I actually would love to answer that question, but I am just not sure. I don't want to mislead you. 